Now, the Mobile Oil Corporation presents the eminent film critic, Pauline Kael. Miss Kale reviews films for the New Yorker magazine and has published a number of books on motion pictures. Here is Pauline Kael with her guest for today. This is Pauline Kael, and today I have Woody Allen as a guest, and we're going to talk about his movies, particularly the latest Sleeper, I hope, but I'd like to talk with Woody not only about his other films and about his career, but about his reactions to films in general and what he hopes to do as a filmmaker and as a performer. How do you feel now about Sleeper in relation to your other films? Because you've directed four now, and you've also written and starred in one. This is a film that I think technically shows you at your best. It shows that you've really learned a tremendous amount. How do you feel about it as an accomplishment? Well, it's an interesting thing. It's, it's certainly uh, been the most successful film that I've done um, and the most broadly appreciated. Um, that, and oddly enough, Played Against Sam, which I, which I didn't direct, those two films, for some reason, have been the most commercially acceptable. I, I feel that's probably because they're the most structured films, the, the most story films that I've ever done. The, the problem in learning anything in filmmaking, I think, for someone like myself, is that I get a chance to occasionally get out around the country from either playing places or talking at a college or some, something like that, and I, I get an enormous diversity of opinion on my film, and it's very tough to put together all the opinions and all the, the speculations I hear about it and come up with something that's helpful. It's really difficult for me. I, I've read a certain amount of reviews of Sleeper. I've spoken to people about it. I've also uh, done the same thing with um, everything you always want to know about sex and bananas. And, and it's very, very difficult. There's such a, a diversity of opinion that it's really hard to be able to assess facts and say, well, it's obvious that these conclusions can be uh, drawn from, from this information. So, so it, is, it is difficult. I mean, I've run into people that, that um, just didn't like Sleeper and, and preferred earlier films of mine. I've run into other people who have never liked a film of mine until Sleeper. And I, I could say the same thing about you know, the other films that I've done. This is the first one of yours that I know of that has captured children, that even small kids seem to respond to it. And I don't know why, maybe it's because you do more physical comedy in this one. I think so. Uh, but it hasn't lost uh, the young adults, so far as I can see. But I've been amazed, even very small kids, I mean three-year-olds who have gone with their parents. In some cases, it's the first movie uh, some young kids I know have seen, and they adore it. And eight- and nine-year-olds love it. Now, I don't think they would have gotten your previous films. They simply couldn't have gotten Bananas. And it does make me do a certain amount of reflection, because I loved uh, the wilder humor in Parts of Bananas. I mean, I thought your, your two Christs looking for a parking place joke in Bananas was maybe your greatest single joke on the screen. Well, that's not a joke kids are going to respond to in the way that mm -hmm. adults would. Uh, but the whole atmosphere of Sleeper seems to have gotten a much broader age group, I think, in the audience. Right. I think you're also right in thinking that it's, it's because it's a physical picture. I mean, it's tons of slapstick and costumes and, and flying wires and, you know, it's, it's a, a really a knockabout picture. At, but at the same time, it's less chaotic. Now, I think maybe I like the more chaotic pictures. In some I got ways. that impression from from your review of the film, right? And I've spoken to other people who felt the same way. Uh, I don't think you're alone in that. There are certain people that prefer a more chaotic approach, you know. And there's again, there's not much one can do about that. You know, the idea generally dictates the approach that, that you take with it. A picture like Sleeper you know, just would never be chaotic. I mean, it, it it depends. When I was conceiving it, it depends on clean visuals and white spaces and, you know, to give a certain kind of impression. I also thought that there were some wild moments in it, but I don't know. I mean, there are people that, uh, that wrote reviews of Sleeper that, that said they felt for the first time I was controlling the comedy, letting, letting the humor come out of the story rather than forcing things. You know, you get a, an enormous diversity of opinion, and, and not, not from irresponsible people. I mean, from people that are trying to assess the, the film. So it is difficult to, to really come to conclusions about it, you know? I mean, for me, to, to be able to say, well, I think this is absolutely right, 
and I've got to keep that in mind. You know, it's, it's a very tough thing to do. Well, I've been impressed by one thing about your work. I mean, I think you're a wizard of a learner. I've never known anyone who, who got into movie making knowing as little as it seemed to me you did in Take the Money and as Run, little, who yeah. has come as far as you have. Because, uh, I mean, when you talk about the clean visuals and Sleeper, actually it goes far beyond that. It was one of the most elegant movies made uh, in the last year. Most of the Hollywood movies, particularly comedies have always looked like a mess and your other films even though I loved the, the wildness and the freedom and the anarchic spirit in parts of them they were hideous often I mean there was really no you, you, you visual control. The visuals right yeah, I agree and with this you. one is beautiful I mean it had it's not just the production design but the look of it but uh, you, you had a comic look that was comparable to some of the uh, Buster Keaton abstract look. And I think that adds to the way comedy plays. When the image itself is very simple and very beautiful, the gags come free and you can respond to them more easily. When the visuals are murky and when you have a lot of color that's, that's running loose and that doesn't serve the joke, it really gets between the joke and the audience. Whereas in this one, every joke is fully released because of that abstract simplicity. Well, it's interesting. I remember once you wrote a review of a picture that um, Renee Taylor and Joe Bologna were in. Oh, yeah, made for each other. <laughs> made for each other. And you got into, just peripherally, a discussion of color and comedy, which I thought was very interesting at that time because you were aware of the fact that it was a problem to comedy filmmakers. I don't know if people have any idea that color is a, you know, is a very tough thing. It's, a, it's another problem. You know, sound is one big problem, and color is another problem, and it's very, very difficult to... Uh, now, fortunately, Sleeper, I think, is good luck because the area that the film takes place, that the drama takes place in, lends itself immediately. I mean, it's, it's a very theatrical choice in a certain sense, because you're in the future, and, and you can do things without forcing them. But normally with comedies, uh, I think that only Buster Keaton made comedies that really look good. I don't think the Chaplin films look no, good. No, I agree I don't think with the you. Marx I, Brothers films no, look good. No, that's true. And uh, I think people who see uh, so many of those films now on television and really just listen for the jokes aren't aware of what a problem it was in the theaters, that very often they just didn't look good, uh, and particularly with talking comedies. But Chaplin never had a very good eye, I don't think, as a director. And he didn't really work out visual patterns for the comedy. He tended just to let the camera follow him, which was often wonderful, but you never got the, the, the joke pattern that you got in the Keaton films. But I think maybe Sleeper is one of the few color comedies I've ever seen that suggested that somebody had devised an aesthetic for color comedy, that really you could begin to talk about color comedy in terms of art because previously the ugliness of color comedy got in the way of taking it seriously. And I think that's one of the reasons that people unconsciously or consciously begin to compare your films to, to early silent comedies. It's because this picture looks so good, whereas your earlier work was less likely to be compared to silent comedy. I think that's true. I think that, you know, when I first uh, was in film at all, when I had written the script for What's New Pussycat years ago, I wanted very much for the director to shoot that picture in black and white. And he, they, they wouldn't think of it, of course, at that time. And, the, uh, and I couldn't give good reasons for it. I just knew that for some reason, color was not good for comedy. And, and at that, uh, you know, in, in the year that that was made, that up until that time, you know, color had never been used for comedy well. And it, it, it's a very, very tough thing. I understood it emotionally without being able to um, articulate it or analyze it, but I knew something was wrong with color and comedy. And, and when one sees some of the Jerry Lewis pictures, yeah, you it's see a, it's a serious problem. The color it. is is not helping him. It, it's hurting. But but the, the audience goes in and and they don't they don't know why they're not being affected by something or they don't know why a joke is ruined. But you know, a, a joke is a very um, kind of tenuous little thing. Well, you know, I only have black and white television, and the Nutty Professor, for example, looks better in black and white on television than it looked on a big screen because the garish color really stood in the way of the jokes. 
and I think a lot of uh, a lot of recent comedies look better on television, whether in black and white or color, because you're not disturbed by the visual dimensions. For example, the Mel Brooks, The Producers, which was so ugly on a big screen that I could hardly look at it. The comedy really emerges on television, partly because Mel Brooks's medium has always been television, mm -hmm. and there are no visual dimensions to it. He really is using the performers, and they're delivering the lines. And, and that picture is really very, very funny on television. The fact is that you're a crazily disciplined man and that's how you've solved it. I think most people, if they get jokes, don't think about the aesthetic problems. I think one of the things that people don't realize about you is the extent of your discipline. Uh, you're, you're about the only person I know in the movie business who partitions his days, who does as many things. I mean, you know, not just actor, a writer, director, a musician, but that you really think over the things that you study, that you work them out. I've always wondered how it is that you do so damn much, because most people like to talk away their days. There's a sense in which after the day's work is over, they really like to relax, and, and they don't care if they stay up half the night and if they're dead in the morning, because they, they want to get away from that all. I get the feeling that you really stick with all the things. It's almost as if you had some life plan. I hate to use such a corny term, mm -hmm. but how is it that you do so much? Well, you see, I enjoy working, and um, I, I have a massive guilt over not working. <laughs> That's one thing. Does that, that mean that, that you get depressed if you don't work? I get nervous, and, I, and I'm not one of life's great enjoyers. You know, I can't go away for the weekend and enjoy myself, or travel and enjoy myself, or go to the beach, or that kind of thing. I, you know, it, what's fun for me is to sit down and try and write something for the New Yorker, or work on a film script. If I'm not working for, for a day and a half, it makes me nervous. I just, you know, I don't like it. And, and you'd be amazed how much you can get done just by consistency. You know, just by, just by constantly working, you know, uh, each day. You don't drink. You don't smoke. You don't care very much about food. No. Uh, right. And you don't have the, the vice of most artists, which is that they like, love to sit around with each other and talk. Or do you? No, I don't have that vice because I don't. I don't think I know any anybody else. I'm not friendly with a with a single other film director or n no single comedian. I guess Dick Cavett is the only uh, show business person that I'm really friendly with. Just as soon work and you know I was reading the review of the new book on Faulkner. Right. Uh, and I, I like that idea. I mean, you know, I think he he really was able to bring it off. I mean, he was a man of extraordinary genius, you know, and it was just wonderful. Uh, but I, I like that idea. I mean, I think you can get a lot of stuff done that way, and, and that's what really counts. You know, I, uh, I've i always felt um, that Mailer did too many things, you know, that, that he was this well, he, he, massively he gifted to the writer. Extreme, of course, sure. You know, and, and, and shouldn't do it. I mean, the important thing is turning out the work. I think only the work is important. But that, of course, is for your temperament. A lot of people need the excitement. They need to be turned on by seeing people. There's a sense in which you need to share ideas. You need to exclaim and expostulate and say how horrible you think something is. I mean, you really need to yell a little to your friends. And it's very surprising. I mean, I couldn't do it because I have the need to blow off steam at night. I need to be with people often. I love to work. I love to write. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I feel this tremendous need. You know, when the cocktail hour comes, I want to see somebody and talk. Really, you know, it's funny. One gets the impression from reading you that you spend an enormous amount of time reading, seeing films, watching television, that nothing that occurs you know, that, that you haven't seen it in some way. I'm always, always amazed at the amount of television that, that, that you've well, seen. Well, you can sneak in, you know, 10 minutes of a series show can tell you a hell of a lot about a series. This is Pauline Kael talking with Woody Allen. We'll be back in just a minute. What does it take to establish a tradition of excellence? TV's Masterpiece Theater, made possible through a grant from the Mobile Oil Corporation and seen Sundays on PBS at 9, has done just that. It has become a Sunday tradition for millions of television viewers. In the past four seasons, with such outstanding dramatic series as The Six Wives of Henry VIII, Elizabeth R., Vanity Fair, and The First Churchills, Masterpiece Theater has provided an experience not common to television broadcasting. This year's first series is the comedy drama Upstairs, Downstairs, and it begins where its predecessors ended, with entertainment at its best. 
Alastair Cook introduces each program and delivers an Edwardian essay as the epilogue to each show. So together with a bit of history and an hour of splendid entertainment, Upstairs Downstairs takes you pleasantly through the ten-year span of the Edwardian era. Mobile invites you to share a bit of the Edwardian age Sunday evenings on PBS at 9. It just may become a tradition in your household. This is Pauline Kale. I'm talking with Woody Allen. We were just talking about the ability to partition your life or my own uh, mm -hmm. a weakness for throwing a certain amount of it away. Uh, Woody thinks I see a lot of television, for example. I don't. Uh, there are certain shows I try not to miss. Uh, Carol Burnett is one of mm -hmm. them because I think she's an absolutely extraordinary comedian. Right. And her physical comedy just excites me so I've never seen a woman who could do as much physically mm -hmm. as she can. And so I I love to watch the Burnett show. I hate it when I, I when I miss it. But I see a few of the shows to get an idea. Whenever I can, when I get home from a movie or a night I'm not at a movie, I'll turn on something. So I've seen the Waltons a few times. You've That's seen enough talk to get shows. I mean I see I see these yeah. references appear in your reviews, sure, but I keep an eye uh, out for what I want to see. You don't really have to spend a lot of time at it. I mean, three or four hours a week, and you can catch most of, of what you want to see. For example, uh, the execution of Private Slovic. Uh, well, I saw that in advance, but I wouldn't have missed that because mm -hmm. it's it's a good show, despite the television critics. But there aren't very many shows like that. You really a special that you want to give an evening to. And, and the talk shows, you can catch a piece of it. Actually, there are very few talk shows I watch now because it's the same personality performers mm -hmm. doing the same routine. Six, since uh, Dick Cavett gave up or was forced out of the nightly show, I don't watch talk shows very much. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do catch the Saturday night CBS lineup. I mean, I try to watch MASH. Uh, and some of those, because MASH is a good show. Mm -hmm. And I like to see new performers coming up via television because they're going to be in movies in a few years, or have been, and I love to see the differences in their styles. Compared to my interest in television, say, remarkable. I mean, you know that you, I've never seen a Waltons, I've never seen a MASH, I've, I see a talk show, you know, well, once a year or something. Well, if you've missed MASH, you're missing the equivalent of the best comedies of the 30s. Mm -hmm. And to see it go on week after week and to sustain that level and mm -hmm. with a stock company of people who work well together, that's exactly what the small Warner Brothers pictures in the 30s were like. Right. It's like what the Paramount comedies did. Anyway, it gets me back to your movies because one of the things I did miss in Sleeper was a cast. I, I think you need a stock company. I think we, you need people to, to, to have different attributes in collision with yours. That somehow the way characters are introduced and slide off and never stand for anything in particular in your movies is a loss. That, that your personality would develop if, if it was in contrast to a whole mess of other people mm -hmm. who stood for threatening figures or non-threatening figures, but who represented other kinds of personality. Uh, do you feel this need in your movies? When I conceive of a film, I, I never think in those terms. I think that it, that it really is a psychological thing, that, that what happens is I think of an idea and work on the script of it, and what seems to emerge, for, for whatever subconscious reason, is a tendency to be out there alone, relying enormously on myself, in this picture, uh, on Diane Keaton to a degree, but basically myself and maybe one other female. Now, I think part of this probably comes from the fact that I began as a stand-up comedian by myself out in front of an audience. And if you look at a picture like uh, Take the Money and Run, my first picture, it's very close to a monologue in certain ways. It's joke, 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 except instead of standing up and telling them, you know, they're, they're kind of played out, but they're, they're many unrelated jokes, and it moves along with no sense of real story, just joke by joke. And I find that because I was a comedian, a, a cabaret comedian, there's a tendency to be out there alone and, and rely on myself to a large degree. What I, what I would like to do in the future, if I can, I'd like to develop the substance of the movies. You know, I'd like to see if I can make the movies more substantial, if I could use the comedy to to make a point now and then or get into get into something that isn't, you know, I'm I'm I've always just tried to 
be amusing, as amusing as I could, with very little interest in, is it satirical, is it saying anything? And I would like to see if I could use the comedy to, to make some kind of substantial point. I think possibly in the course of doing that, automatically other figures of importance would arise. But they have to be developed. I mean, that's, I mean, that's one of the things that's interesting about television comedy, seeing the interplay between Bob Newhart and Suzanne Plachette, seeing the way it develops over a period mm -hmm. of time. Uh, one of the things that I think your, your movies have lacked so far and that Sleeper is beginning to get is really taking a gag someplace, building with it, rather than throwing it away. But you don't build the gags as far as you could. And I think part of the problem is you're working basically alone. Let me just ask one question. Sure. Well, I, I agree with you um, that in the earlier films that I did, there were one-shot things, you know, that, because when you're doing a surrealistic film, there is a tendency, at least for me, to want to hit and run quickly. In Sleeper, I made a concerted effort to try and draw out the gags more, try and build them more. But uh, I'm not sure where specifically you're thinking of that you, you felt I could have had more fun. I'm sure there are areas in that picture that any question I that I could have. I think there are story elements that could have developed. There was more potential in mm -hmm. the jokes than, than you got out of them. Yeah. And there's, this, there's a kind of mildness, finally, when it's over. It could have gone farther. It could have built more. And I think that's, that's partly because you're not playing against other people, with the exception of Diane Keaton. You just don't have enough people to make you resourceful. You don't get the interplay mm -hmm. of comedians. Mm -hmm. Something develops in the interrelationship that doesn't quite happen in your work. And I think almost all the great comedians had that. They each had a small stock company. And they, they took their inspiration from that and from the interrelationship. And I think, in a way, you put too great a strain on yourself. And then if a joke doesn't work, it's lost, because there's nobody to pick it up and throw it back to you. That could be. Uh, you know, I have, I think, other problems that are that are not as easily solved, uh, you know, as some of, the, um, some of the earlier comedians or the television people. Now, of course, if you are working with three or four people on a weekly basis, year after year, that takes care of itself once you filter out the ones that can't do it. Um, and then it's almost what I'm doing, or what I have done, is almost like a painter who's painting primitives. No, it's no longer so primitive. <laughs> but but, but w yeah. what I'm getting at is uh, the early comedians were, film was comparatively new at the time, I'm, and it's very tough to to work in the mode of a classic kind of comedian today. It's not so easy for me because, first of all, I talk, and, you know, Keaton and Chaplin didn't, and when they had to, they fell apart, I thought. I thought that Keaton talking and Chaplin talking were awful, in my opinion. But um, No, you're right. You know, but nobody's going to dispute that, I don't think. True. Uh, it, it, uh, it was, I mean, something went totally off, but that was their comic persona was so well, well, was so linked to silence. Right. You see, there's there's a tough. Uh, I think you need to talk there. more. Actually, people love you as as the smart talkative. Yeah. Kind of, that's that's uh, it. You know, it's it's such a strange thing that if Chaplin or Keaton spoke in the great films that they did, you would not have expected them to speak funny, they would have spoken like real human beings. You know, I'm expected to speak amusingly. You know, so the problem... Uh, you created itself. that expectation. <laughs> well, it's, it's <laughs> geometric. So on the one hand, you do physical comedy because that's one of the great staples of the screen. And the, it's very hard to reconcile the two. The person who does physical comedy and can also talk like a human being because when I'm sitting here talking to you like this or as I would talk on the screen and say hopefully amusingly then to get up and and drop into a sewer or 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 to to teeter on the edge of a building there's a there's an inconsistency between the broadness of really broad physical clown like comedy and the fact that in in real life when I'm talking you know I'm not talking commensurately broad with that so so there's a, there's a lot of problems to work as a comedian now, and uh, a comedian in the sense of Chaplin or Keaton. So occasionally I might have a tendency to, to do more of a story kind of picture than they would do, and less of, less of that 
odd kind of art form that that they developed, you know, uh, th their films, a comedian's film is unlike anything else. I mean, it's it, it, the star of the film is not the director or the script. It's it's almost like put the camera on Chaplin, and let him go, and it's conceivable that he will sustain the hour and a half for you and be hilariously funny. Well, of course, remember, he did a picture a year. I mean, when you say let him go, every everything there was hairbreadth timing. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he worked on it. I mean, he would work months, you know, on a few minutes of film. Right. So that, I mean, the camera stayed on him, but it wasn't as if he was taking off. But it, it was a performer's medium sure. with, with a comedian. Sure. You know, and now we're we're kind of beyond that. It's not... It, it's not so easy to do that. Now, you know, films have come a long way and stories are more complex and sure. characters... I think part of the problem is you just don't have the time anymore. That it used to be you could work a year on a film mm -hmm. if you were a great performer. Now your shooting schedule is so tight you, uh, and everything is so expensive that a lot of it is a little bit slippery, it's a little unrehearsed, the timing is a little off, and so the jokes just don't have that perfection. They don't have mm -hmm. the purity. I think this is Jerry Lewis's great trouble. His films are just so sloppy so that the five or ten minutes of each film in which he's really great is, is buried in such a mass of muck that it's hard to sit through the movie for the few minutes in which he really has it worked out and it's right. In your case, you've got a pretty good batting average, but partly that's because your comedy isn't as dependent on that split-second timing, because it isn't the physical comedy that does require everything to be perfect, because the verbal jokes, you're, you're good enough and fast enough to, to, get, to get by with. Even if, if you'd had, say, 10 minutes more, you might have gotten a little bit more of a laugh on it. Mm -hmm. you, and I think people maybe are not as wild for the, the perfect movie as they used to be. A purity in the silent comedies was often sort of a bore. I think that's why a lot of us loved the Marx Brothers and the early talkies, because we wanted to get away from all that comic perfection. And there mm -hmm. is something very relaxing about jokes just thrown off. And uh, the kind of, uh, uh, a little sloppiness works. But if you're using a story structure, as in Sleeper, mm -hmm. then you're aware that the sloppiness is, is killing the joke, too. Well, I mean, you, it's, it's, you know, it's a double thing. I don't know the answer either. You need, you need the exact right mixture. It's tough to do comedy in the sense that when I see an old Buster Keaton film, sometimes I'm dazzled by the technical virtuosity. I mean, it's just incredible. And I might not even think it's that funny. You know, I mean, he does. He he personally doesn't kill me. I don't find him a very funny man, but a brilliant executor. I mean, absolutely brilliant. Well, he's beautiful rather than funny. Often, he's just yeah, exactly. Beautiful I to think watch. he's beautiful too. I think everything about him is be beautiful. His face, his body, the the conception and execution of the gags is is really poetic. Chaplin uh, makes me laugh more frequently, even though. You know, I get chills from him sometimes when he's when he's wrong. But he's, but, he's so often wrong that I'm I'm so disturbed by Chaplin that I really can't enjoy him, uh, the way a great many people do. I always was disturbed by him, even as a child, because the pathos, and the masochism, and the funny mixture of elements in his comedy always really put me off. I used but when to cry. He's on, he's on, though. I mean, when, when he's great, he's absolutely great. But it is a mess. I think it's a terrible mess. When he's brilliant, there's nobody to touch him. Uh, but he's, he's so often a mess. I can understand why he's not that popular with students anymore. And I can see why, because I really didn't enjoy going to a Chaplin film. I didn't really want to see his films in the same way that with early talking comedies. I mean, I, uh, you know, when you go to Duck Soup, it's pure pleasure. Whereas when yes, you went to a Chaplin film, there's a certain amount of misery and discomfort. And some of them, I remember taking my child to see City Lights and having to take her out because she just couldn't bear it. I mean, it was, it was too much. Yeah, not to me. See, City Lights, to me, is a film that, that works. And, I, you know, I loathe sentimentality as much as anyone. And yet, for some reason, to me, I thought he hit it right on the head in there. I thought he had just enough sentimentality and didn't go over the edge for the my taste. The sentimental one of his that I love is The Kid. 
the very early one because it's such Victorian sentimentality that mm -hmm. it didn't disturb me. It didn't, it didn't make me want to cry. Oh, we have to take a break. Uh, this is Pauline Kale talking with Woody Allen. We'll be back in just a minute. the best American film movies because I'm dying to know how he feels about some of the films around. Uh, for example, Mean Streets, which I think was, was probably the best American film of the last year, and I think it's the real scandal of the Academy Awards that it didn't get a nomination. How did you feel about it, Woody? Uh, I agree wholeheartedly. I thought it was the, the most okay. fascinating and the best film that I've seen in, in probably a few years. I mean, it really was remarkable to me. Um, first of all, I thought it was incredibly modern. You know, it, it, it just, it made everything else seem creaky. Even, even terrific pictures like On the Waterfront or Bonnie and Clyde, it made them seem creaky with its, it had a, a modernity to it because it has, first of all, I respond very well to improvisation. Uh, I like that a lot. And it had a, a random quality to it, a kind of ambling quality where scenes, there I thought scenes were picked up for a moment, little scene, and then kind of dropped and thrown away in, in the best sense. And yes, I love that about it too. And I think it's one of the things that the Hollywood people don't understand about it. Uh, they think it isn't well structured. I think they're, you know, you couldn't be more wrong. I think mm -hmm. it's so personally structured that they don't exactly, understand it. Exactly. And that's what makes it seem so modern, the way it flowed. That's what I thought. I thought that it was, it was truly like a new piece of music or something where, uh, you know, a breakthrough in structure because for some reason there was, uh, you know, your attention was held throughout the whole thing and yet if you look at it, it was incredibly rambling and, and, and indulgent in spots and, and yet I could see, when I saw that picture, I could stay in the theater and sit through it again immediately because it was so incredibly fresh because of the way that it was done, you know, between the improv. I thought all the performances in it w were good, I mean really good. I, I thought De Niro was uh, remarkable, truly remarkable. I mean, I thought I thought that was the best, the most exciting for me, the most exciting uh, performance I had seen since Marlon Brando years ago. I mean, I thought that uh, this was a guy that just uh, was touched with. He, he the really good has it. He's been doing phenomenal work in rather obscure movies in recent years, and then here in this picture, he did that bravura, flamboyant. Uh, work that you know, nobody else around can do and of course he's young and he just did it with all that assurance and of course he played so beautifully with Harvey Keitel yeah. who I thought was remarkable me too I, I thought he was wonderful I thought the performances were were wonderful and the the style of the film was wonderful and there was there was no you know, there was a true vision in that film the director truly had a vision I thought of he had something to say and it was though he could only make that statement in the form that he made it, and I thought it was a really a remarkable film. And and the proof of it to me is that films that I've loved, you know, like Bonnie and Clyde, which I thought was a great film, seem creaky next to it. They, you know, I think that's true because in a way, this is the real new generation. This is somebody who uses film as his own medium in a very different way from, say, someone who has come from the stage or from television. Uh, someone who's who's working in a more committee-like setup. I mean, you you felt that this was all his. I mean, even though he had a co-writer, uh, an old school friend, I think, an old buddy who had been through the same experiences with him. Mm -hmm. uh, you you do feel that this is the only way he could have expressed it, and this was his life. Mm -hmm. And of course, that isn't true of, of Bonnie and Clyde, which I adored. I mean, it, I it, it is a breakthrough too. movie, I it was and a great, it's great film. But this this is already the next decade, and boy, a decade in movies is is a lifetime. I mean, movies have gone so fast the last few mm -hmm. years. Ever since, really, Godard. I think broke through. Uh, in the, uh, yeah, I think he really changed the whole course of movie so much because now we just don't look for the same kind of structure. We don't look for that impersonal kind of movie. Now we want something else. I mean, every once in a while you get an impersonal movie that's just great fun. I mean, I think Sugarland Express is great fun. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you really want that personal feeling. You want, you want the movie director as artist. 
Uh, and, you know, I mean, it sounds terrible. I hate talking about art. And when I heard, uh, you know, that word being thrown at James Cagney on the tribute to him, I was embarrassed. But it is true that now when we go to a movie, what we hope for is that at least for me, I hope for that beautiful integration. It's what I feel in Bertolucci's work. And mm -hmm. it's, of course, it's what Godard really, I think, was the first one to have to that degree. Film after film, you felt you were seeing him develop as a person. You were seeing the ideas and the new attitudes and his new love troubles, what was going on mm -hmm. in the world, in his mind. I mean, you saw it all from Breathless through through Weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it was his whole creative lifetime there. And a few years. In the case of Bertolucci, seeing his movies from, from his start when he was 20 up through what he's doing now in his early 30s, you feel the whole richness of a developing artist and it's right there on the screen. Right, right exactly. There's, a, there's an involvement, you know, it's what Salinger wrote about, the, reading the book and wanting to call up the author after if you're, sure. you know, and that's exactly, you know, and I did feel that with uh, Mean Streets, that there was, you know, in some way he managed to make his own personal, specific, highly special experience, totally universal. Now, you know, I, I don't think the picture has done well commercially across the well, United States. Well, it has States. not been helped by the company's campaign. It has the worst ads of any right. movie around. It, it unfortunately is the case that the movie was made for peanuts. I think it was made for something like $380,000. Mm -hmm. And then when it was purchased by Warners, I don't think they respected it since it was made for so little. And of course, unfortunately, Warners has The Exorcist this year and is putting everything behind The Exorcist because they want prestige as well as money. Mm -hmm. And they want prestige possibly in order to give it a, a little better look for Europe and South mm -hmm. America and, and wherever they're going to release it. And they have simply let uh, Mean Streets die. They haven't even opened it anywhere. I understand they, they don't think uh, it has any commercial potential in the rest of the world, whereas I think it's really the movie of the year. It, yes, and it, there's no question in my mind about that either. But I'll tell you something interesting, and I guess sad in a certain way. I, I saw Mean Streets a few times in East Side cinema where it was playing I think cinema two or something like that there were some people in the audiences that were just crazy for that film they had seen it before they were yelling things I mean they were just in love with it as I was there were a good number of people in the audience that left after both times I saw that that couldn't get with it that found but this it is true for every breakthrough movie sure I, I understand really that but when I saw The Exorcist which I saw coincidentally on two consecutive nights, two two groups of people that I was with socially. You mean you saw that me, damn thing twice? I, I saw it twice, <laughs> two consecutive nights at two different theaters, because it was just a funny coincidence. Did you like it better the second time or less? Uh, I, I had the same feeling both times about it. I mean, but the, the audience feeling was very interesting because the audience was led to believe, and, and this is a, a, really a positive response, the audience was led to believe that they were going to see something truly special on that screen. And when they came out of the theater, most of them felt that they had seen it. Most of them felt, right. I didn't find it a scary picture, but the scenes in the bedroom with the little girl, several of them, were so shocking to that audience, not frightening, but shocking, that when they opened the door and the girl was on the bed and they'd play out two minutes of her screaming and smashing her mother and then slam the door on the girl, the audience would burst into spontaneous applause both times as, as kind of a tour de force, you know, what you would think on stage would be Willie Loman or something. I mean, a sure. good, <laughs> and, and when they left that theater, well, of course, they were all disappointed for the first hour. They all felt, you know, yeah, I mean, they wanted the big hour. stuff. And sure. then that when they got into that, it was an interesting thing to me because the audience was leaving and they were telling their friends, you've got to see this if you don't see it, because there was a special quality to it. They'd had it. They, 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 they were satisfied. They were They'd satisfied. gotten the shocking. But I think so much of this is the expectation that develops through the public relations and the advertising around a film. I think if Warners gave any thought at all to Mean Streets, if they used some of the press reviews, if they gave people a sense of what the movie was like... Well, it would uh, help, no I, question I think it would help it. just tremendously. You have to have some sort of of expectation. There's so I many think that ways. would all help it. I, I, you know, I don't know in the end 
over the, the broad mass of the country, if b living in Little Italy for two hours, as you actually did, you, he just thrust you down there and would mean anything. I don't know. I would I hope it would because it was... In the I mean, I have a lot of faith in the audience because I think it is a young audience uh, that is willing to give a movie a chance. See, it doesn't mm -hmm. bother me if people go to some piece of, uh, I mean, if they go to The Exorcist, because, you know, what the devil, I mean, people want to go to be shocked, and it's a big event, it's like a national catastrophe, let them go, okay. But if they don't go to something that really has a future, and that oh, spells sure, a future movie, I get, I get terribly disappointed, and I have a strong feeling that they will go if they're given any kind of a chance, that the company has to have enough faith in a movie, has to be willing to go with it and prepare the public for it. But if if the company itself doesn't believe in it, if they don't know what it is, and I think often in Hollywood they don't, because they really like to make movies the old way. I mean, Billy Friedkin is a director they understand, whereas Martin Scorsese is a director they don't understand, the same way they don't understand Robert Altman. Look at the way Thieves Like Us was opened in, in a tiny theater uh, that's out of the main path of traffic. I mean, here's a movie by perhaps the foremost artist artist working in, in American movies right now. At least of his generation, I don't think there's anybody who can touch him. He can do things that nobody else can do. He can do things that nobody else would even think of doing. And they open his picture in an obscure little theater because they don't understand it and they don't believe in it. Anyway, but I haven't asked you how you feel about Thieves Like Us. Well, it's interesting. I saw Thieves Like Us about two weeks ago. I thought the audience was let down when I saw it. There was a small audience there that night. I, th I think there's some problems with Thieves Like Us for me. One is that, first of all, you, you are immediately aware when you make this kind of film, even though it's a, a different film, totally, you're immediately aware that, that Bonnie and Clyde was made. So right away, the, the, the joy of recreating the 30s, the gratuitous violence, the slow motion death at the end, all those things you've seen directly in Bonnie and Clyde. So there's an inevitable comparison to it. The next thing is that there was a sense in the audience of, I thought, that it was remarkably tasteful and low-key and beautifully done. And when it was over, it lacked for the audience and also for myself moments of great emotional excitement, laughter, sadness. It didn't have, it, you walked out without the kick. It was like a great filmmaker had told this story with superb taste and great artistry and you, you didn't feel enough. You, you were not involved in the story too much. There was something lacking. When that audience filed up the aisle, they, they all said, yeah, it was great looking and the, and the creation of the period was lovely and the little girl was dynamite. But for some reason, we're not too thrilled by it. I mean, we're not... See, I think you get involved in a different way. We need to take a break. Uh, let's talk about it when we get back. Okay. This is Pauline Kael. I, I'm with Woody Allen and we'll be back in just a minute. What does it take to establish a tradition of excellence? TV's Masterpiece Theater, made possible through a grant from the Mobile Oil Corporation and seen Sundays on PBS at 9, has done just that. It has become a Sunday tradition for millions of television viewers. In the past four seasons, with such outstanding dramatic series as The Six Wives of Henry VIII, Elizabeth R., Vanity Fair, and the first Churchills, Masterpiece Theater has provided an experience not common to television broadcasts. This year's first series is the comedy drama Upstairs, Downstairs, and it begins where its predecessors ended, with entertainment at its best. Alastair Cook introduces each program and delivers an Edwardian essay as the epilogue to each show. So together with a bit of history and an hour of splendid entertainment, Upstairs Downstairs takes you pleasantly through the ten-year span of the Edwardian era. Mobile invites you to share a bit of the Edwardian age Sunday evenings on PBS at 9. It just may become a tradition in your household. This is Pauline Kael. I'm talking with Woody Allen, and we were just discussing Thieves Like Us. Uh, Woody said that he felt there was a disappointment in the audience, and I gather that you shared it, that mm -hmm, you wanted mm -hmm. something bigger to happen emotionally. Is that it? I wanted to leave that theater with a, an emotional kick 
commensurate with the amount of artistry that was up on that screen. That obviously, Altman knows exactly what he's doing. He's got a tremendous command of the medium. He's innovative. He's wonderful. And yet, when I left the theater, something was lacking. I didn't have the impulse to, to say to people that I was with, you know, God, I was moved, or wasn't that fascinating, or, you know, it was so touching, or so if, incisive. If, or... Do you have this reaction to European films? Because I think something that happens with, with Robert Altman, people aren't used to, maybe, mm -hmm. and that is that there is a smoothness in some of his work that he just doesn't go in for the usual American-style climaxes, that his work is much more like, say, the, the films that Jean Renoir made in the 30s, and that when you're looking at a French film of a certain kind, you don't expect the high points. I mean, you expect mm -hmm. the high points to go on inside yourself. I mean, a movie like Voodoo Save from Drowning or uh, A Day in the Country or Renoir's Madame Bovary, they have this same fluid, simple quality. They just flow from scene to scene and go on. And it works inside you without the big explicit climax on the screen. And I yes, felt, it, if it works. I, yes, I, I agree no, with you completely. You it, did it, feel if, it did. If it works. I, I didn't... I didn't and I didn't feel anybody in the audience did. I, I felt, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, for me, a film does not have to have an immense amount of theatrics and fireworks. I, I certainly don't mind the playing out of a low-key kind of thing. Or what to How think do you of feel, the... I mean, the scene, for example, uh, of, of Bowie, the prison break scene, and then when, when Bowie leaves Chickamaw on the road. How did you feel about that scene? I was not taken with it. I didn't think that was one of the better scenes in the picture. How I thought you... the best scene in the picture for me overwhelmingly was the scene in the house. In the, the house dinner. of the enactment of the robbery or, or the, the everything dinner table. Everything that went on in that, the dinner yes, the table, was, the kid the tap was... dancing with the little mirror on the floor. That's you get involved mm -hmm. in it, and then it comes to the end. And, and you, for, for a long time afterward, you think back on, on those lives that you've been part of. Uh, that you've been there. And I just think it works at a totally different level from most American movies. Well, it may be that you're right. I don't know. I, I certainly didn't No, no, no. I mean, it isn't a right or wrong in this. I mean, I mean you know, it's simply how different there. people's temperaments react. Elements He's a particular that I never taste. There's no question yeah. about it. I mean, you know, I thought that was true of The Long Goodbye, too. I thought that The Long Goodbye was all right. Oh, God. Well, <laughs> see, that's where he really did. I thought The Long Goodbye was the funniest. Uh, you know, the yeah, most yeah, I wildly know, I know you funny did. movie. You see, and I, I can't imagine year. that it was wildly funny, nor do I think that that almost any audience would ever consider The Long Goodbye wildly people funny. People are laughing. Oh, 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 no. I mean, I, I saw oh, it with an do. audience. Oh, but they do. I mean, loads of people just, just adore it and find it very funny. It was a great success, you know. It would surprise me. I mean, I can't, you know, because I'm sensitive to things that are funny as well as the next oh, man. Oh, sure, and, sure. And I, and I can't... <laughs> I, I, I think I'll go along <laughs> with you on that. I mean, I, and I didn't... I didn't find it funny. I mean, I found, again, there's an unpredictable quality about Altman that's, that I do appreciate enormously. I mean, you know you're not going to get a factory-made film that he's, that he's always ahead of you, yeah, that yeah. you're not ahead of him. And I thought some of the scenes with uh, Mark Rydell was superb. I mean, I just thought, I thought he was, that well, was just I really a great... thought Elliot Gould was carried the picture. As a matter of fact, I think, except for Mean Streets, Long Goodbye, I'd say, was, you know, the next best American movie of That's interesting. Of and I think I really certain other critics, it. yeah, certain other critics did, too. Uh, but, things like us and, and The Long Goodbye, I think both got a very good press in New York. And, uh -huh. and I think they deserve a good press. I'm just saying that I think that when audiences went in to see The Long Goodbye and Thieves Like Us, that... What happens is there there is something that they're not attuned to or that Altman is not giving them or there's something not connecting there. Consequently, it sure can. You know? <laughs> uh, but, you know, this is interesting because, in a way, you're, you're, you're working in com Altman's just about the only director who's working in comedy in an innovative way, really, besides you, I think. Uh, and, of course, he doesn't work in comedy very often, but he mm -hmm. did in The Long Goodbye it's and so in funny. MASH. You see that as, as well, MASH, and, certainly, and it's very that interesting comedy. that you don't 
uh, that you don't like his work. I mean, oh, no, if no, you no. ask me the, about the, some other film critic, I might feel the same way. No, no. Well, the, I wouldn't say I wouldn't yeah. say uh, I don't like his work. That, no, no, know. no. But that you don't have that really personal. I certainly direct did not response. find it doesn't the just long goodbye you funny. Up. I mean, oh, it doesn't I have a double hard me time up repressing all. laughter in order to hear the next line in the long goodbye. I mean, really? it really, it really has a freaky humor for me. That I mean, I thought Elliot Gould was so brilliant in it. I couldn't believe it because I hadn't been that fond of him in a number of things in recent years. I kind of think he's good. You know, he's got a he's got a nice quality. Uh, I think, he uh, sure has a relaxed, offbeat, funny way of sliding into mm -hmm. a line so that it just it but takes I, you by surprise. I could, n I mean, I would never think of that picture as funny in a million years. And, you know, listen, there are people that think Beat the Devil is funny. I'm not one of oh, them. Oh, really? Oh, oh, well, see, I, I love Beat the Devil. I, know, I mean, when it first opened, I was, you know, the, one of the rare people in the theater howling. That, yeah, and it's very similar, uh, so that makes perfectly a, good sure, sense. Sure, it's a certain type of, you know, it's a certain special taste. I mean, I never found Beat the Devil funny at all. I mean, to me, I have no idea what the conception of it was, but to me, it looked like a giant mistake that guys got hung up on a film and, and realized that they, that it was too awful to be serious. Well, I don't think that's quite the case, but I don't think Bogart was in on it, however, because his performance looks baffled. He doesn't really seem to realize how funny he is. Yeah, I, I, I thought there was one or two good moments in terms of comedy in Beat the Devil. Yeah. Bogart uh, could never do comedy, do you think? I mean, that's one of the things that say that separates him from, from Cary Grant. Yeah, there are all, certain people yeah. that can't do it. Brando's one who can't do it. I thought he was rather funny in a couple of scenes in Bedtime Story, but I mean, really? Yeah, oh. yeah. I, it was a degrading, awful picture, and I was embarrassed for him and most of it. Me. And then his mad Rupert or something, a couple of scenes, I thought, my God, he's funny. Anyway, you were going to say, uh, I'm sorry, I interrupted you on, on Beat the Devil. I recall seeing it a few times and, th and thinking... I guess some people will find this funny. I'm not one of them. The, the, same, the long goodbye, I didn't even think the long goodbye. I, I thought what was good about it was not the, the comic aspects of it. I mean, I didn't think, um, I, I never regard, I would never regard that picture as a funny picture. I, I regard that picture um, as a certain kind of unique type of picture. Well, it's satirical. It's also beautiful, of course. I mean, visually, it's simply extraordinary. I mean, Altman has an eye. Yeah, although if you look at the, ex some of the exteriors uh, don't kill me, and I'll tell you why. When he's shooting in an area like uh, in, in uh, McCabe, or, or when Altman's working in, in, say, Thieves Like Us, with a different cameraman, but when you're shooting in an area that's kind of gray and misty, you get that beautiful look. But I found the exteriors in The Long Goodbye were frequently those typical kind of sunny exteriors that just didn't look great to me. Now, I'm not talking about the structure of the shots or the movement. I'm talking about the lighting. Well, how you know, did you feel about the structure of the shots, though? The way uh, action moved from foreground and, and background? I think that he's kind of great thing, that, that way. I, I, I just I think I he's dazzling that way. But I thought there some were, of those shots. I thought some of, the, some of the things in Thieves Like Us, from a technical point of view, were dazzling. I mean, I, you know, uh, or in The Long Goodbye, just right off the, right at the beginning with the, in the supermarket, uh, some of that stuff just killed me. I thought it was wonderful technically. I just thought that in the end, when I left the movie theater, I need more. You see, I think uh, God, Mash. A lot. I think Mash or or McCabe uh, was a greater bow to to theatricality, and consequently, McCabe was a much more conventional picture. I thought Mc much. More. I don't think McCabe was conventional. I think McCabe has an you know ultimate resonance that is perhaps greater uh, than any of but his. But it's films. an understandable story to people in in much more classical terms about the two people that get together and and uh, the gunfight at the end. I mean, there's a, there is a a much more um, conventional structure to it than something like Thieves Like Us or, or uh, The Long Goodbye. The, the Long Goodbye, I thought, was a truly unique picture. I mean... Um, I think maybe each of his pictures is. I would hope that, that from recent years with college kids who have developed, you know, a willingness to sit through a movie even if it's ragged or even if it's imperfect or even if they don't understand it completely, that they would be so, so responsive to mm -hmm. Altman or to Martin Scorsese or to other people who are doing something very personal, that the whole idea that a film had to be that impersonal, satisfying whole would, would disappear, and that really we could evolve so that, so that people would accept movies for the pleasures they offer along the way, 
and and not be disturbed if, say, there isn't a big climax or a big resolution or a big zing. Oh, at the I, end. I think that's a good thing. It, the only the only thing is there has got to be ultimately, I think, something that the audience some kind of satisfaction that they leave with it, it needn't be a large climax. See, I don't, I don't really think so. Uh, bananas, for example, the last half hour or so of bananas really fell apart. And yet, and yet the, there are the, people that, that find that oh, the sure, funny I think, half hour. I thought, well, I think bananas people love despite the fact that it fell apart. I mean, maybe some of them liked the last part better than I do. I, I, I think some of the work in Bananas is your best work. I mean, I really like a lot of it. But of course, uh, it's easier with the picture of individual jokes, too, yeah, to, sure. to say, well, I like jokes 8, yeah, 9, but 10. But people and have often been been willing with, with Hollywood movies, even, uh, say, the Bogart movies and the rest of it, the ends were often sellouts mm -hmm. uh, or letdowns, or a lot of those women's comedies, at the end, the woman would have to settle for home right, and husband right. and the rest of it. And yet they'd had such a good time up to that point. The pleasures along the way satisfied them. But I think it's, it may be true that when a movie is more individual, when it's more personal, we may resent it. A little bit if we don't get the standard pleasures and and that's a problem that it may take a while I think it's a problem for the older audience in general I think it's why they're not go to see pictures say by an Altman or a Scorsese because they really want something simple and basic that they can understand and even if it falls apart that kind of picture they will forgive but they won't forgive a picture that doesn't give them a powerful climax if they haven't quite understood it along the way because yes, I think they want they yeah. they've got to get some kind of some kind of fulfilled feeling from it, and I think what happened in Thieves Like Us the night that I saw it that the audience left that movie theater, and this was an East uh, you know an East Side audience who had mm -hmm. deliberately chosen to see that film, you know, with left it with with a feeling of that they that they were not fulfilled, that they... That, I felt it was so perfectly know? rounded as an experience. It's so interesting. That quite, quite the opposite feeling. Oh, I wish you were could, writing criticism so we could compare notes on movies. You're, 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 just, on his, you're just on his wavelength. I, I mean, guess I you know, am. It's a, on exactly the other hand, on he it. has made a couple of movies, uh, Images and Brewster McCloud, where I just wasn't with him right from the first shot, practically. Right, I but they're still, they're, they're still novel pictures. I saw Brewster McCloud. I didn't yeah. like it, but I thought it was... It, again, not the work of a hack. Not the no, work oh, no, of, no, no, you know, no. He's, that he's, man just he's always have playing a hack around bone with something. In his body. I mean, that's his difficulty in Hollywood, I think. Mm -hmm. oh, I wish we could go on. Thank you. This is Pauline Kale. I've been talking with Woody Allen.